have it here. Uh, expanding on the um, lab equipment, so now we're, I have acquired a logic analyzer, HP1658. And I thought we have a little bit of a dive into it, so we'll have a look at some um, spec information first and then um, actually dig into what it looks like. So, oh, what is the HP1658? Um, logic analyzer, not exactly new generation. <laughs> Time has passed. Um, it's got um, 80 channels and um, you can do um, 100 megahertz timing and 25 megahertz um, state analysis on all the channels, so that's 80 channels. And you um, can go through the short list here. Some of the more key lights, transition or glitch timing modes, uh, simultaneous state and uh, state or state timing models, so you can mix. Okay, not a very deep data caching, but one kilo deep memory on all the channels. And this is important glitch detection on all channels. Pattern edge and glitch triggering. Um, Overlapping of timing waveforms, and this is actually cool. And you can um, compare to yeah, cheaper hobbyist uh, logic analyzer that you actually have several depths of um, sequence. So you can say wait for sequence A and then wait for subsequence B and then subsequence C, uh, continuing down to eight levels before it actually triggers, and it does that with patterns also. Uh, Yeah, I think that's pretty much summarizes it. So anyway, this device comes from around 1987, around that year. I'm not sure exactly what date code the specific uh, device that I have has, but um, around that year. And um, here we see the front panel layout, so it's got a built-in CRT display. It's got a floppy disk drive to boot the operating system for the logic analyzer, and then it has a bunch of buttons and a and, uh, a wheel, so no mouse. <laughs> it pre predates mouse control, so it has more like this um, from those days conventional cursor, um, you know, you wheel toggle and press button stuff. So I'd just like to show the breakdown of the probe structure because this will be important when we actually look at the physical device that I have. So um, here's the probe cable, and there are um, five of them and then um, goes into a probe housing and then you plug in these probes individual probes and it has a grounding probe separate and also these probes here you can plug you can plug in a grounding cable a shorter bar and then it has grabbers that are, you know, so you can actually connect a grabber to to this probe here end and then um, connect it to the to the device um, that you're testing and um, there's a lot, quite a few, uh, these documents and other documents exist. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the description, like the search words that you can use to find the documents. Uh, they, they, you can find them in many different document repository sites, but I'll, I'll put in the search criteria so that you can actually find them yourself if you're interested. Now this unit um, actually can support many different um, processors or um, pre what they call pre-processors in the language of the documentation so you can actually have adapters or active adapters so that you can um, plug into um, different CPU sockets and, and um, so break out external boxes and stuff and I, d I don't have any of that, that equipment and I don't have the supporting software either so this unit came with the um, basically the standard um, out of the box sort of uh, logic analyzer operating system so it, it hasn't got um, things like bus analysis software or pneumonic code conversions or anything so it's just the yeah as as you would go and buy it as a standard edition so here's 
the actual device. So let's have a look inside. Power cable. And then lots of cables to connect to the target system. So let's take an example. So you have a flat cable and then you have the probe adapter. And then this unit has five of these flat cables and one end goes into the device and then the other end plugs into the probe adapter right way around. So clicks in like that and then you have a mechanism by which you can use a pan if you would like to remove individual probes. So you just press down there and then you can pull it out. And, um, so you don't have to have all the, all the um, probes in place. And um, one of the things that one has to take into account when you're buying this type of equipment on the market, but um, you have to make sure that they actually include these. Um, yeah, I'll just call them flat cables, and, and all of them. So you have to check how many, you go into the specs of the device and see how many there should be and then make sure that you clear all of them. And um, also check that you have these um, probe adapters and the actual probe cables to the wires themselves. And they, looks, they look like this, so one end plugs in there and on the other end you have a, have a hole to plug in a ground cable about that long black and then you actually have the signal coming into this this here and um, sadly in many cases they if it's used equipment then uh, and in this case we notice also there's two empty slots here and why is that because there is a, uh, a clock probe signal on one of these and then there's a should be a grounding cable which is yeah, similar to, to this, just black and with ends in that. And um, in, in my case, I didn't get any grounding leads for the actual pod. And the <coughs> I don't have enough, enough of these um, in good shape to actually have the um, populate the clock for all, all the um, five, five um, uh, units. And um, then also I, do, I don't have grabbers, so there should be a set of grabbers that are included here. And that, that's what we, yeah, we went over in this um, sheet showing the different components. So if you're in the, in the business of shopping for one of these, then you need to make sure, that, uh, at least in the pictures, that the majority of the um, probe side of things is also included. It's actually rather expensive to get these replaced. And um, also had a problem where many of the, uh, well not many, but some of them, uh, the probes are, uh, wires are broken. And um, not, not that easy to fix because it's, so this is some um, lost its end, could be fixed. And then, well this is a bit more difficult when you have a, a twisted pair in, which is, um, melded into the plastic here, then that's not something that one can really fix that easily. So, one has to, basically my instruction is that if you're considering a, uh, this type of old equipment, then um, yeah, download the um, user manual and then check what accessories the, the, the standard version should contain and then um, use those pictures against, or diagrams, descriptions against what the seller has posted and then you get it so you don't just uh, end up with a device and you don't even have you don't have a flat cable you don't have the probe adapters and, the, and it's like yeah and then you have to spend a whole bunch more money and time to get the probes i mean i can survive with this set that i have in this case that came with the device uh, and i don't think it's super critical but i i am shopping around for um, to get a better set of these. So, but it, won't, it, won't be, it won't be cheap. So, anyway, so that's that. And as I said, there's five of those. I won't 
take them all out and point the same deal for all of them. And then, um, no, and then we have a... I got actually several boot discs with the unit, so that's good. So some of them have an X marking on them, so... But this one has um, been validated and I actually booted the system with this, so... That's it. Um, it should work with that. And actually, interesting enough, it comes with the original protective <laughs> slot in. And I can actually put the disc in there. It's been a long time since I've used, used those discs. I don't have any other retro equipment. So anyway, let's um, tour around the back just to... Well, here we go. So now you can see the back side. And um, yeah, this unit has, uh, I think those are external triggers, not probably not going to use them that often. And then it has the intensity control here for the display. Here you have the on off button, on mains plug in. And then here we have the locations where you plug in them. Um, Pod cables. Well, it must be only one way around that you can plug these in, but this doesn't seem to be keyed. No, wait, of course it's keyed. So, anyway, let plug it to here. So, so that's what it will look like. So yeah, five of these sticking out to there. Um, I did mention in my. Uh, in the prelude to this that you can actually have um, pre-processors uh, for the unit. So then usually they um, uh, <coughs> that's tough. But usually they connect directly to these. So if you have a, like a breakout, external breakout box adapter, then it's usually you just plug in these cables directly. Or if it's a um, pre-processor for a specific Processor socket, um, same deal, so they usually connect directly to these cables. Or, in some of the um, preprocessors, I think they actually came with their own cables that are already connected to the preprocessor, because well, they call them preprocessor units. And then you, you plug them directly in here. And then you have the you, you have to have the, uh, the accompanying software also, so it's not just enough to have the you know, har hardware adapter, you, you need to actually have um, have the software. Um, yeah. so, I think that we will I try to move it around again. Man, that's heavy. External trigger output. External trigger input. So this stuff that you can chain this with other equipment. So let's plug in the power cable. So and um. Ah, oh, this is what I initially did when I got the unit, and uh, I put it on, and then nothing happened. It was totally dead. So, so I thought, oh no, I got a dead unit. Then. And what, usually, sort of after a while, when it comes to, oh, I need to check the fuse. So, and I was thinking, yeah, it can't possibly be the fuse. But then I actually did. So I took out the, uh, yeah, as you saw when I showed it, it's, um, it's a rectangular plastic piece that you, you you insert one way around for 110 volts and the other way around for 220. So I checked that it was on 220, so that wasn't the issue. And then, um, so I decided oh, I'll take it out and, and check the fuse. And I was thinking, yeah, I can't possibly be the fuse. So <laughs> when I pulled pulled out that um, voltage level, physical voltage level selector, when I pulled it out, the fuse fell out. <laughs> It was it was the fuse. The fuse wasn't broken. It was just it just in transport. It somehow being jarred. 
it fell out of its position. So I put, pushed the fuse back into its position, put the block back in place, and then it started. So anyway, let's give it a boot up. So, real retro feel. And starting up. And then it starts an internal diagnostics first, and then it starts loading the operating system. And it's not an incredibly large operation. And, and the initial investigations, I don't really get anything special with this unit. It's, it's pretty. It looks like it's pretty much the base software that comes with the with the basic um, logic analyzer. So yeah, now it's loaded. The, so actually, it's 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 software driven. This whole environment. So so basically, it it, it does whatever you have available to to load into it and and i mean hp sold both hardware preprocessors and then presumably a whole load of um, different types of software solutions so um, as i said I, I only have access to the basics so it's now it's working as a basic logic analyzer so anyway that was the overview for that So anyway, that's that, and um, now of course it comes to the point, is this um, still useful with today's tech? So, um, of course, it, uh, with the discs I have, it doesn't have any bus analysis capability, not even I2C so, or ISP, so that's a bad bummer, bummer stuff. Uh, one could argue that it's slow um, if you're going to... Uh, start analyzing gigahertz systems, then obviously this isn't going to cut it. And um, and of course you can argue that since we have system on chip solutions mostly nowadays, then um, I mean there's no direct access to address data and control signals in the SOC. And then you have FPGA solutions where all the circuitry is internal, so one could argue that it's actually very difficult to get access to them. But I'd like to actually throw out a few um, ish points here that that um, I think justify still paying the amount that I paid for it. Um, if one just takes, ignores some of the limitations and takes cost per channel, it's still, you know, for a hobbyist, from a hobbyist perspective, it's still the cheapest solution out there. If you if you're looking for, um, yeah. Like 64, like 80 channels. I mean, it's like it's very hard to build a to build up a <coughs> logic analyzer set with 80 channels without spending quite a lot of money. So on the used market, I still think they're competitive from that perspective. Um, you know, even if the device itself can't decode the um, digital bus signal or whatever, it doesn't mean that it can't capture it into memory. And then, of course, you can ship that data over to the PC. I mean, it has an R, um, a serial port, this version, and, and if you look at various HP analyzers, they have one or the other types of different types of um, interfaces for, to be able to communicate externally, even if you don't use the floppy disk. So let's say that you can pull over the data to the PC. There are quite a lot of um, open source solutions for decoding. Like if, if you have the state data, it can be decoded over to clear text or an uh, analyzed um, bus or yeah, whatever. Um, now, if you're having your own FPGA designs and you are in control of that process, there's nothing actually um, preventing you from exporting any of all the signals that you have in the FPGA. So, basically, from that perspective, it's a you can then analyze those signals. So it's not a lost cause, even if you have, as long as you are yourself in control of the FPGA uh, source code, then, then you have the option to export wherever you want. Uh, arguably, raw CPU data address control um, diagnostics is. Uh, it's become less important when it comes to when you have system on the chip solutions and. You have things like YTAG um, debuggers, um, 
yeah, so so on the, like that low level, then basically I don't think that you would be using the logic analyzers and those to work with motherboards of modern category. They won't be using this type of equipment anyway. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, and then of course the sock has to be connected to things to be able to do things. So um, there's a fair amount of SPI, I2C, um, or just ones and zeros controlling stuff. So you can still analyze those. Um, this is of such an old generation that actually doesn't understand the concept of 3.3 voltage volt um, logic, but uh, you can get around that with yeah, level shifters or actually using custom to a certain extent, you can adjust the um, trigger level so that it will still work even with 3.3 volt logic. So I, I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, it's going to be an addition to my stack of equipment I'm going to use to yeah, mostly educate and visualize um, logical circuits. And um, yeah, well, I think it will be kind of useful to have. And um, yeah, well, I'll see you guys in the in the next one.